sometimes towards the very beginning of somebody sitting for me. It, it only occurred to me recently, I quite often start with a drawing rather than with a painting, partly because I think the sloshing around of paint may make the sitter feel that the whole process is so idiotic and unreadable and messy and that they might lose faith in the procedure, although most people are simply forbearing and keep on sitting. Whereas the drawing, they can see that there's a visible image at certain points in the occasion, which perhaps bears some relationship to what people might expect of a drawing of an image. And I think that it might reassure them that the whole process isn't a piece of total madness. The actual activity is pretty speedy, but as one goes through the whole thing again and again and rehearses the forms and their relationships and the possibility of analysing or extending or dramatising or uh, characterising the forms in various ways, a whole repertoire of thoughts accrues. And that when the thing is finally finished, what seem to be the interesting exciting, true, new ideas that have occurred to me. This is, of course, an ideal. I don't mean that every drawing is exciting and true, although I try. But that it's very, very much a question of rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing in the same way as one would rehearse for a play. And then, very often, if a play has been really properly rehearsed and worked through, there are possibilities, among other things, of improvisation towards the end that don't break the continuity. Buried deep or seemingly deep within your portrait drawings, we typically find or often find what have been described as the pictorial ghosts or signs of earlier erased drawings. And I yes. wondered what role you think those ghosts or those signs of earlier drawing, yeah. what role they play in the final image? Well, as part of the final image, they're certainly not, as it were, extraneous to it. For instance, if there's a ghost of a drawing and the actual image, the visible image, as it has in one or two cases, slipped sideways or downwards, then I am aware of what has gone on where the thing started originally and try to fix something that I haven't been able to fix or discover something I haven't been able to discover that is what I hope for, which is something that is true and unfamiliar to me and a surprise to myself. On the other hand, the surface, which is the scarred and surface with various blots and blotches and ghosts on it, is absolutely taken into account and is, for me, as much of the final image, part of the final image, as the graphic head which could be picked out of it. It is, for me, an image from corner to corner right across the whole surface of the drawing. I have to have make more visible marks as I get towards the end, but also the whole process for me has to do with something called inspiration. And sometimes when the final image is, say, is done in Indian ink or acrylic, there actually is a moment after what is often weeks or months of drawings when I have the courage, or really it feels as though the muse is visiting me, if that doesn't sound too soppy, but the muse does play a part in my mind. And I suddenly pick up, and with really, I'd never know when this will happen, Indian ink or acrylic or something, and make an image across what I've been doing when I've suddenly felt a complete command of a new idea of the subject. Your portrait drawings feel like very open images. They're animated as much by the gaps left between the marks that you make as by the marks themselves. Isn't that true of all drawing? 
Maybe. It is, you know. I mean, the blank paper, say that Rembrandt drawing of the sleeping girl in the British Museum, marvellous drawing, seems to be done in five minutes, with a few ink lines, perhaps you don't know, but it's a famous and favourite drawing of mine. The white part of the paper is as much bulk and space uh, as anything in the drawing. It's, a drawing is eloquent in, in its spaces as much as in its marks. And it, 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 in fact, the sensation of drawing is very often enclosing masses and spaces, imaginary masses and spaces, on a blank or a white sheet of paper. Many, many drawings have this character. Many of the greatest drawings maybe are defined by this character. That The viewer has a lot of latitude or freedom in working with and interpreting and engaging with the image. Well, you say that, but think of a Watto drawing, if you can call one to mind. Those amazing drawings, perhaps Watto and Rembrandt, are ahead of anybody else in catching life on the hop. You know, people are sitting on the ground turning their heads and so on. I think that the sensation is pretty specific. It's not limbed by cast iron lines that contain something like a mould. One feels nothing could be moved by a millimetre without making it somehow more banal or less true or less alive or less specific. Third drawing that you made in 1960 of Stella. Um, yes. You know, people say those drawings are very heavy charcoal, they're very dark, but this particular drawing, where her head's almost to the edge of the right hand edge of the sheet, and the, everything on the other side is, is light and white, and yes. indeed in her, and then the patch has very straight lines. And I just wondered, first of all, why you stopped drawing Stella, but also if you remember that kind of, it's, it's almost the contrast to a very heavily worked charcoal drawing. We're talking about um, 65 years ago, and uh, it, it, I, I, nothing is conscious in that way. The, all those drawings were done in the downstairs bedroom with Stella sitting in front of me, me on my knees with a drawing board on a chair and they simply came out differently. There's nothing more, you know. And in fact, because I was always afraid that she would stop sitting, and that uh, I didn't realize how long these things would take, once or twice, I'm afraid, I pretended that the drawing was, when it was finished, was not finished, got another sheet of paper, drew a rough version of the previous drawing and misled Stella into thinking that I was going on with the same drawing which hadn't been finished. As to why I stopped drawing, it's very simple. I created vast clouds of charcoal everywhere, which was all over the place, including in the bed, everything. And finally Stella rebelled and I turned to paint, which while it made blotches on the floor, didn't actually fill the air or cover everything in the room with a black dust. That's very interesting, and it may be a, the reason why this last drawing of Stella is so fresh and white in that way. And then when you begin drawing Gerbaum and Helen Gillespie, particularly the head, and they often don't look at you, you can tell, I think, perhaps that they're less intimate. Were you aware yeah. that they were very different? I wasn't aware, I'm never aware of anything. I just I carry on with do what the muse tells me to do. But of course it was a different situation. The Stella situation was intimate on every level. Also, the business of drawing was intimate. I mean, I don't know how she put up with it, really. I was a very short distance away from her in a little room, and uh, there was a very strong connection, as it were, in the air, whereas Gerda Böhm and, and so on were further away from me physically, and I didn't have the same feeling of empathy with anybody in my life as I'd had with Stella, due to the fact that we both behaved as badly as we were capable of and still managed to stand each other. Your drawings of regular cities enable us to follow them changing and ageing over time and of course changing in relation to your own changing practice. But do you see your long series of drawings of these cities as in some way biographical projects in which you trace their lives? Only in looking back 
I don't try to project an idea on the sitter, I try to put down the truth. But what is to me rather touching is that I can see, I mean, in the case of Jake and Julia and indeed Catherine, I can see the process of ageing occurring, and not only their ageing, but also mine. And this is really, it's, to me, that is part slightly of the magic of art. It starts off as an immediate day-to-day -day thing. I was just thinking of this today, and if you'll allow me just to diverge for a moment. I, I, there's an exhibition coming that contains a painting by Michael Andrews of what became his wife two people from very different backgrounds. And I remember when they got together, and I remember people thinking this couldn't possibly last. And I remember the whole fraught and, and individual and dramatic and affectionate and uh, situation. And then he did this painting, and it's been somewhere for 50 years, and it's come out now. Well, I dare say the same thing preceded the Ropeby Venus or the Duchess of Alba. It starts in life, unless it starts in life, unless it starts in the actual frantic, doomed existence that we have. It isn't art at all, and it finishes up as art, and that is one of the things that is so immensely magical about the whole business when it works. There are a lot of drawings that are called oil on paper. Yes. Or they're drawings or paintings. Did they all began as? They all began as drawings, without exception. And sometimes it may be out of various impulses. That, but sometimes it may be simply that the whole thing had become too inchoate and dark and rough, and that I picked up paint in order to go on with it. And then the viscosity, etc., of your paint. Um, yes. You say that it's always experimental and different every time. Absolutely. I never know what it's going to do, but I think that's true of everybody who paints. Do you think that happens to this, almost the same extent with the drawing materials or not? To a certain extent, it does. The last but one drawing that I finished, it's very odd. They have started recently with the same things, same sort of paper, same sort of graphite and so on. But the last one I'm drawing, I don't know what it was, it behaves differently every time. The materials behave differently. And the last but one, there were patches of where I tried to rub out what I'd done that were simply ingrained in the paper and to such an extent that the whole drawing became, you know, very, very dark and inchoate as though it were happening in the dark. And I didn't know how it could possibly finish, but perhaps it's a weakness or possibly even a strength that I never leave anything, I go on and on with things. And then suddenly I found that taking a different form of graphite, I worked across this dark, scratched, variegated, labored mass of rubbed out blotches and managed to find an image in it. But working with the same material, same paper, same stuff, it never happened in precisely that way and it happens differently every time. It's very mysterious. Everybody who paints genuinely, I think, is at the mercy of the unpredictability of the materials they work with. When you were speaking to Richard Calvagressi, he asked you whether you ever were tempted to use a spray gun. No, I haven't. I wasn't tempted. I never got round to it. I like to feel that I'm actually engaged with what, in my mind, is a three-dimensional form displacing space. And I can't imagine doing that in any specific way with a spray gun. I never know what will happen in the future, but I've never been even slightly tempted. I don't mean that I think it's you know, beyond the pale or wrong or anything like that. I can see it absolutely works for people, perhaps people with a more adventurous or subtle attitude to painting, but it wouldn't work for me. There's a definite relationship between portraiture and caricature, and it would be ludicrous to deny it. After all, how do we recognize people? By the way they diverge from the proportions of other people. And this is exactly what caricaturists, talented caricaturists, of whom there are not all that many, what they hone in on. Some of Rowlandson's 
ladies seem to me to be as lovable as they are caricatured. And indeed, Max Beerbohm's, where Coleridge is talking to a table, everybody's fallen asleep because of his legendary ability to go on talking for six hours, is actually an affectionate tribute to Coleridge rather than any sort of excoriation of him. There isn't even a very fast, hard line between caricature and portraiture. Good portraiture can often have an element of caricature and actually fairly quiet caricatures, and yet one feels splendid likenesses like Max Beerbohm, verge on portraiture. Good art, in a sense, all has an element of caricature, because caricature, what is it finally but forceful portraiture? I think all good painting is abstract. I think non-figurative painting is abstract painting with impoverished material. And when I drew in the National Gallery, of course, all sorts of considerations go through my mind when one's drawing. But it is really a question of drawing the forms, not the implications or the effect they have on people or what the story behind it might be, hardly aware of it. I was drawing these coherent and subtle and surprising collections of forms that make a single form in order to give myself an idea of how a worthwhile image is constructed. None of these considerations about whether it's a portrait or who it's of or so on. Okay, I mean, you know, obviously nothing is not thought about. One can think of as many things about painting and drawing as one does about life. But I certainly didn't draw it because it's a portrait or anything like that. I think I was tended to be, on the whole, drawn to a certain form or collection of forms that I needed at the time. And what happens when you're drawing from a mirror image? That's a good question and it's very different. Because if you have somebody sitting in front of you and you want to understand what you're drawing, it's not a retinal image, you have to have the the lump and the displacement of air in your mind. So you go look around the side a bit, get an idea of what's going on, see people in motion, and what you're drawing is the whole head in the whole space. Now, if you're looking at yourself in the mirror, if you try to look around the side, your head moves around the side as well. So you're not, you don't get the same image. So I do very much more, many different things. I draw, myself in the mirror. I look even more than I usually do at the image in the mirror. I sometimes look at the image and the drawing and the reflection. I move around a lot and I do very many different things. And sometimes I do what I hardly ever do when I'm working from people. I look and remember and move the image somewhere else and try to see what I've done and try to work while looking at the mirror. It's a more complicated process, simply because the model is not static. To make a very broad generalization, there is a way of working in art I might cite, say, Van Eyck or Bruegel or Bosch or Dali, where the artist seems to have to be walking a tightrope and seem to have to be enchanted and concentrated on what he's doing so that the work gradually accrues without any slackening, without any diversion and, and is in doubt until the last moment. And there's another sort that might cite, I don't know, hundreds of people, Manet or Rembrandt or myself, where we do the thing again and again and again. And in my case, if you do the second one, I think even more than the first sort, what comes out is something akin to handwriting, and I can no more characterize or analyze it than I could my voice or behavior in general. It's absolutely unselfconscious. It's the result of my practice, which is of a particular sort 